Okay. Well, thank you all again for, for joining us. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Bob Massa, and I have the privilege of serving as the Executive Director of the Hudson Global Alliance. Uh, today's seminar is what I would call high level. Uh, that is, uh, our purpose today is to think strategically about how we can minimize obstacles to international student recruitment and success during global emergencies. Uh, we're learning, obviously, a great deal as we move through the pandemic, uh, and we need really to take some copious notes on what works and actually what doesn't so that we can be better prepared to pivot uh, both during the current crisis uh, and to successfully confront the next one. Uh, before I introduce my partner in the webinar series and, and also in the in-person symposium, which we have scheduled for October, uh, let me just tell you briefly about uh, the two organizations, the company, Hudson Global Scholars, uh, and the nonprofit, uh, Hudson Global Alliance. Uh, Hudson Global Scholars uh, works with a handful of U.S. prep schools and a larger number of international school partners uh, to provide really tough flight U.S. education to international students through a combination of best-in-class online curriculum with highly qualified instructors and personalized learning experiences. Uh, students who complete the program successfully and, and this is the, the, the key difference here, they will receive a high school diploma from the U.S. prep school partner in addition to their homeschool diploma and will, uh, as a result, I believe, be better prepared to uh, enter into top universities in the U.S. Um, uh, Hudson Global Scholars will also be available uh, to assist schools and colleges in recruiting and enrolling both these and other international students. Uh, the nonprofit Hudson Global Alliance, which I lead, is a growing group of globally minded admissions professionals and international educators who we hope can learn from each other and from acknowledged experts in the field to better understand uh, the needs of international students and to serve those students who want to study in the U.S. And we do this through our webinar series. This is one of them. Uh, with helpful articles on our LinkedIn page, which I invite you to, to join at Hudson Global Alliance on LinkedIn, uh, and through the annual symposium, which we will host uh, somewhere on the East Coast uh, on October 4th and 5th. We haven't decided yet because of the little situation that we find ourselves in, that we all find ourselves in at this point. So uh, anyway, more on that later. Let's get to it. Let me briefly introduce Dr. Nick Arundel. Uh, Nick uh, served with me at Johns Hopkins when I was the Dean of Enrollment there. Uh, Nick was the uh, Director of uh, International Student and, and Student and Scholar Services uh, at Johns Hopkins, uh, a good friend and someone who I've kept in touch with over the years. Uh, Nick, uh, why don't you introduce our panelists? Sure, um, I'd be delighted. We have two panelists here. The first one I'm going to introduce is Dr. Pierre Wood, who is the Vice Provost and Dean of International Affairs at the University of North Texas. Her responsibilities include international student recruitment, campus internationalization, study abroad, international student and scholar uh, programs, sponsored students, international partnerships, international risk, man risk management, and intensive English language programs. She also is responsible for uh, international programming and uh, the international alumni programs. She is also the past president of the Association of International Education, uh, Education Administrators. She also was, has an active role in the American International Recruitment Council and uh, the International Studies Association. She regularly conducts workshops on international recruitment and enrollment management and career development for international offices and in higher education. The second person we have is Dr. Dulip Dulasali, who has been active in international education for nearly uh, three decades. He's, he serves as an international leader and has held leadership positions as a dean at LIU Global College, Dean and Professor, School of Humanities in the School of Business at Manipur International University in Kuala Lumpur, uh, Malaysia, and Associate Professor and Assistant Dean of, uh, of Global Education at Marist uh, College. 
He has co-founded the admission table, which uh, focuses on using artificial intelligence, natural language processing, and mobile devices to recruit international students for universities worldwide. He has traveled extensively. He has it's noted that he has traveled to over 100 countries. He has lived in many of them. He has served on the board of various international uh, uh, organizations, including the European Association for International Educators, the National Association for Foreign Student Advisors, the Association of International Education Administrators, the Council for International Educational Exchange. In uh, 2016, he received the EAIE President's Award for uh, contributions to the profession. And in 2008, he was awarded AIAE's Rudolph Award for his contribution as an international educator. Oh. And with that said, <laughs> I'd like to uh, welcome both to the first annual, the first inaugural uh, Global Alliance uh, uh, webinar series. And now I'd like to turn this over to Bob and have him ask the first question. Okay, great. Well, it seems that uh, our panelists, I think, know a thing or two about what we're going to talk about today. Uh, as I said, we're, we're going to try to keep this at a strategic high level. Before we, we start, though, Pia, can you just, just very, very briefly give us the context? I, I don't know if, uh, uh, you know, University of North Texas is in North Texas. It's not, you know, in El Paso uh, or San Antonio. But uh, can you give us just, uh, you know, a 30-second uh, overview? Yes, I'm happy to. So the University of North Texas is located very near Dallas. We're 30 minutes from Dallas in a town of Denton. We have uh, 40,000 students and we have 11 colleges. So we have all of the normal engineering, business, um, arts and sciences, health and human services, et cetera. And we have uh, about 2,700 international students. So we have a fairly robust uh, international recruitment team that uses a, a variety of methods to recruit that we'll talk about, I'm sure, today. Great. And, and Dilip, just very quickly, uh, you were at LIU as Dean of the Global College there. Just a 30-second overview of the Global College. Yes, uh, Global College is something uh, rather uh, unique. It, uh, basically takes American students uh, abroad and they spend uh, seven of their eight semesters in different parts of the world. Uh, so it's a, a very different kind of uh, bachelor's level program, which I was uh, heading at that stage. But I would like to uh, comment on the admission table uh, portion of it because it's more relevant to today's discussion. And that had to do with the fact that we were using artificial intelligence and mobile devices to penetrate markets, to find those elusive students that all our universities were looking for. And so we did that for five years before it was acquired in 2018. Great, thanks so much, Dilip. So, so let, me, let me just get right at it. We're um, uh, in the middle of a global pandemic, in case anybody didn't know, uh, the likes of which we really haven't seen in our lifetime. So I wanna start with a really easy question here. How is this going to change the way in which US colleges and universities recruit and serve international students, big picture, Pia? <laughs> Well, I think you have to think about this issue in short term and longer term. So in the short term, I think many universities have responded the same way. They have decided the only approach they can do is through digital learning or through online. So we ended up the, this semester, spring semester, and we're planning for the summer that we're all going to be moving online and we're going to offer the courses to international students wherever they are, either in this country already or they aren't able to come here. So we would offer them uh, online courses as well. Uh, in terms of recruitment, we also have recognized that nobody can travel at this point. So recruitment is also moving online and those universities who have who have a digital platform already I think are at a big advantage and it is one of the things that in the longer term I think universities will will look at more closely in how do we recruit 
more in the digital world than perhaps we've been doing now. So in the longer term, so short term, we're all online. In the longer term, I don't think face-to-face -face recruitment will end. There's a huge industry around face-to-face -face recruitment, fairs, companies, agents, that all very much are focused on face-to-face -face type of recruitment activities. But I think all of us are going to be adding a digital type, if not, if we don't already have it, supplementing what we have with more digital online recruiting and connecting to students. I think that that is a future recruitment strategy we cannot ignore. What about for students who are uh, uh, returning, students who are already there, delete? Already where? Or already on campus or already uh, taking uh, uh, classes in, in terms of uh, how we serve them. Okay, uh, so yes, that is something which I, again, uh, using something which is pre pretty prevalent at all universities, we are learning as we go. Uh, we're trying to see what model works best for these students, because uh, many of these students have come to the United States uh, to learn in the classroom, and suddenly they are being shifted to an online environment, which is challenging both from the uh, student perspective as well as the academic and the teaching perspective, uh, because they're adjusting to it. Uh, we still have to figure out, you know, how best to serve the students, how best to keep them informed, to keep them engaged. Uh, in the case of international students, we have to be our offices and the universities have to be also ready for, at various other fronts. I mean, especially on the counseling side of things in terms of uh, you know, providing that kind of mentorship, which was readily available by knocking on a professor's door, but now it's going to be different. How do we make that accessible? How do we readily provide them with that support as they kind of are a little more isolated in this new learning space that, that we have been forced to create for them? So I think there'll be a lot of learning for all of us in terms of as we move ahead. Uh, and as Pia pointed out, we are still, we're all on the same page right now. Each university will start looking at, you know, what is best for their institution, given literally the physical space of their institution. Mm -hmm. Uh, what what elements would uh, function on their in their campus with their faculty? Uh, can they kind of look at different models to make this happen? So there's going to be a lot of thinking. I think it will open up the door for some very creative and innovative approaches as to how learning might and will happen down the road. But those are the things that we need to be thinking about. So I'll go back to one thing, which uh, to add to what Pia was saying in the recruitment cycle. I think one of the things that uh, we will have to uh, become sensitive to is provide training to our staff now that the recruiting process is now going to be, of course, online and a lot of it is going to be technology driven, that they will be or will be expected to provide literally the whole uh, cycle on online. So there will be a lot of you know, uh, counseling which will have to happen. They will have to be readily available to these students you know, especially in different parts of the world, different um, time zones, how are we going to be readily available and to answer those questions? I think those are some of the topics we'll of course discuss later on in the hour, I'm sure, but I think that is part of where we will be going. So it'll have to be a synchronized effort on the part of various offices on campus as we move this forward step by step. So do you, let me just follow up, do you, do you both uh, see the continuance of, of using technology the way we're using it uh, through these virtual meetings, uh, even when we're quote unquote back uh, to normal, so sort of a hybrid uh, model emerging? Well, I think this is the big question and the very interesting question that we don't exactly have an answer to. But now that all of our professors have been forced to teach online, including many of them who said it would be impossible, they now know that it is possible because they have to do it. And many more students have taken classes online now, including international students. So every student has been introduced to the concept of an online class, which had not happened before now. The question that was, is interesting to me is whether or not this experience will lead to more students wanting to have online classes. Will international students, for example, who have been taking online classes in their home country, 
is that something that they would continue doing, particularly if it's cheaper? Is this going to open up an entire online programming effort by universities? Um, at a, or will it attract a different type of student than the ones who would come to the United States for other reasons, such as OPT, CPT, and, and those types of things. So it is an unknown, and I think the universities who are positioning themselves to respond in all of these arenas, you know, robust digital platforms where they can teach online, continuing to recruit, recruit students to come to the US, they will be the most successful in my mind. Yeah, and I, I, I do think that, uh, that we need to be careful, I'll just leave it with, uh, at, at this, that um, teaching through Zoom, for example, um, and, uh, and, and maybe using some sort of uh, course management system is, is not um, a, akin to uh, a full online course presentation. You know, obviously, um, with, uh, with the ability of students to measure their own progress with some automatic um, uh, response mechanisms, things that really uh, comprise an online learning platform. Um, many colleges that weren't set up to do that to begin with aren't doing that now. So if they move online, it can't just be uh, a replacement of face-to-face um, uh, -face as, as we're doing now. It has to be much more sophisticated to be really useful, I think, to students. Would you agree? Yeah. Yes, and, and I think the online, there are many universities who already have entire programs online that have been devised precisely to be online. Right. What many of us also are doing now, as you have said, are simply using Zoom <laughs> to have sort of a remote class as opposed to an online class. Good point. Good point. And I think the, the one advantage here is we are, we are dealing with a generation that is extremely savvy in their use of technology. So it's not like, oh my God, how am I going to do this? They are pretty comfortable with it. It is the, the, the faculty that have to become comfortable of how to teach this generation, which is very, and in, in my case, I know it has happened. Many times the students come with the suggestions or recommendations. Hey, have you tried this? You know, it would be great for us to kind of collaborate in this way. And you kind of adapt and adopt it because it works, because they have worked it, they have used it among themselves. So I think that is going to probably usher in a different approach. And as faculty, we would have to probably bring that into our methodology and pedagogy of how we impart education and how we connect with these students because they're familiar with it, they're comfortable with it. So I think that learning you know, takes a little bit of the pressure away. It is only we on our side that we have to kind of go with the change and flow with it because it will uh, move along. I do believe there will be some kind of hybrid element for international students because as Pia pointed out, they are coming here for a purpose. And so for them to be left out of not experience, uh, experiencing the American college environment and lifestyle, the, the notion of networking, getting to know people and interacting with them, uh, that is part of the, the charm. And then of course, to be able to move on with that experience and connect to beyond into the OPT and other kinds of experiences. Great. I should mention uh, too that uh, if anyone uh, in our audience has questions that they want to ask the panelists, uh, you might see a little Q&A box um, uh, at the bottom of your screen. Uh, you can just click on that, ask the question, and we'll make sure that, uh, that it gets answered. But let me turn it over to Nick uh, for, for a second question. Yes. Uh, we know that the number of traditional college uh, students, as well as our domestic students, uh, are going to decline in the nine, in the 2020s. We know that that population is going to de decrease. We also know that we're going to be looking for ways to, to to make up that difference. And in order to meet that demand, what regions of the world do we need to take a look at? And if we decide to go to uh, uh, regions that we had not historically visited how much time should we spend there and how much should how much should we invest in order to make that effort worthwhile do we 
Uh, I think the regions of the world are pretty much going to be the same. I mean, after all, it is only one world. It is the same number of countries. It will always be the countries which have large populations in a certain age bracket and which have, uh, don't have access to education readily uh, or at least quality education readily. So those will continue. You'll still have the Chinas and the Indias, maybe the Brazils and the Indonesias and a few other countries will crop up. Um, in terms of what we will see, and I hope that uh, this will probably will lead to it, is greater penetration in these countries. So going beyond the typical five, seven, eight cities, the urban areas that universities have gone to, go beyond and try the other cities, because you know, these are countries with large populations, which means their tier two and tier three cities also have millions of students available uh, for recruitment purposes and who don't have ready access to either agents or access to you as a university. So we will, one, on the one hand, see a, a hopefully a greater penetration, and that is where technology could come into play, which will allow them to probably penetrate these markets and access students who are living on mobile devices, and so that would be one way. The other is, even the other countries where we have traditionally not recruited, I think it would be a, an appropriate time for you to look into, say, your alumni bases or the communities that surround your university or larger uh, areas, if there are people in those countries, you know, start exploring students who have gone back. Can they become, you know, agents of, uh, of change for you in terms of getting the word out? So I think there will be a greater kind of uh, approach to looking at other options. Even though if you're bringing in a couple of students from those countries, you want diversity, you want, you know, different kinds of students. So those are the kinds of things I think we will probably start seeing. And I would recommend very strongly for universities to start looking at. Pia, yeah. do you have any anything more to add to that? Yeah, well, I, I can, I certainly agree with Dalip. Uh, I think India and China are countries that you cannot diversify away from. They're, the numbers of students coming from those two countries is so high that you can't afford not to be recruiting in those two countries. I think moving to third and fourth, uh, fifth tier cities uh, in both of those countries is also a good strategy. We are um, also moving to look at countries that maybe we didn't spend as much time in. For example, we are looking at Nepal and Colombia and other countries. But again, the big numbers are not in those countries. Um, so. Uh, we're looking at ways to attract students because we feel that one of the barriers, the biggest barrier, is the cost. So we now are devising different strategies that would lower the cost. So, for example, we have community colleges uh, very close. We have community colleges in Denton, in the town that we, we uh, the University of North Texas is in. So we've created a program where students can directly go to the community college for two years. They can live on our campus because community colleges often don't have dorms and that's the big concern for undergraduate students and their parents. They can live with us, they can go there for two years and they can transfer seamlessly back to the University of North Texas after two years. So for those types of programs, we're looking at countries that are very cost and price sensitive, Vietnam, Nepal, Cambodia, mm -hmm. um, Etc. So I think a university has to have numerous strategies. You cannot have a recruitment plan that has only one or two or three. It really has to now be extremely flexible in terms of how to reach students. How do you see the role of the alumni uh, playing a taking a bigger role in their recruitment process? It seems to me that uh, alumni. Uh, if in fact they are organized or have an opportunity to organize, can be a tremendous asset to any institution that's looking to build that relationship. Uh, what plans have you guys developed in order to utilize them? I mean, you, uh, unfortunately, international alumni have not been very well documented at universities for a variety of reasons. I mean, it's uh, no point going into those now, but this might be a time for those alumni who have been active and who have made an effort to engage with the university over time uh, to kind of send out feelers and to get them involved a little bit 
there, of course, there is a time commitment. You know, we don't want to print in terms of how much time is expected. But at the same time, all they have to do is kind of provide the, the face and, and, the, and their story and to help in terms of identifying either a high school or a college or you know, com different community groups. So they do have a very specific role. Uh, each university, of course, has to look in as to how they want to engage uh, with this alumni. And my experience has been all alumni are very excited about doing something for their university. They've never been engaged actively. So this might be a very you know, opportune moment for them to get involved and to help with whatever it is. Uh, because their alma mater is, is struggling and it's reached out to them. So I think there is a, it's a nice time to kind of send out those feelers. Actually, we work with our international alumni um, quite often. We attend quite a number of fairs, face-to-face uh, -face type fair activities, and we always invite our alumni to come along and they're always willing to come and talk to prospective students. So we found that to be a, a really good way to engage our alumni. Of course, we have the same problem that many universities have. We don't actually know where all of our international alumni are. So hunting them down um, is often a, a struggle, but we have, we have actually hired a lot of international students um, and ask them, we hire them as student workers, and their job is to try to find our international alumni, and that has been very productive. Uh, so I think international alumni um, efforts are great uh, and can be very helpful. So we have, uh, we have one question from uh, an audience member um, that, that really, that asks about, you know, because uh, online recruiting, has, has really uh, taken off in the last several months uh, uh, to put the finishing touches, so to speak, on recruiting students. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, budgets are likely to be cut and there's going to be expensive travel abroad. Um, do, you, do you see a continuation, Pia, of online recruiting um, to at least partially replace some travel uh, going forward? Um, I think it depends on what type of online recruiting you're doing. Um, what does that mean exactly? Are you just attending webinars? Are you, you know, how are you, how exactly is your online recruiting structured? I'll just talk about the University of North Texas. I'll be perfectly honest with you in that we didn't have a very good online digital recruiting strategy. We relied as many on our own travel and meeting face to face and we work with agents. So we spent a lot of time in India and China and elsewhere communicating with our agents, which by the way is, has been really helpful since they're still in the country and can help us recruit uh, even though we can't travel there. So given that I went to ask our provost if I could in this financial time if we could still invest in a digital strategy platform mm -hmm. which we she agreed and so we have uh, con contracted with a third party who does digital online recruiting and uh, we are going to be part of that platform so to me it is i don't see how in the future people cannot be engaged digitally when it comes to international recruitment uh, more robustly than they are now, but but not to replace travel, right? Or, or I don't think I don't think we're we're hoping to do both. I don't think we can really replace the face to face right. interaction we've we're having with uh, with our students. Right. Uh, let me answer it from a the, from the other side, from a student perspective, a prospective student perspective. Again goes back to their comfort with technology and how they communicate and engage. And I think that needs to be taken into account as we develop our strategy, because many of them tend to be more comfortable using their mobile devices to communicate and interact. So yes, while right now we are dealing with online technologies and you know, recruitment, we need to also understand what works best in terms of you know, how robust is your uh, you know, platform in terms of either if you're partnering with a third party or your own if you're planning to develop the engagement aspect because this is a generation which is what I call a seven second generation. You have to get their attention within seven seconds otherwise you've kind of lost them. 
So you have to develop those, uh, the ability to interact, engage with them on a re regular basis, which was not the case say, in, uh, in, the, in the past say, or even with face-to-face. -face. So I think uh, as we move forward, the cost aspect will come into play. Universities will realize you know, what your yield has been using online technologies as well as face-to-face. Uh, -face. And those decisions will be made. Sometimes it may be a little tough to pill to swallow, but other times it might be effective and efficient in terms of what your deliverables are. So I think as we move forward, I, I have a feeling, strong feeling there will be hybrid. <coughs> you want your brand to be more visible and that is where you will make your uh, travel uh, approaches. Mm -hmm. But I, I suspect that we will start using agents also in a, in a hybrid role of being our spokesperson for them because while we do travel, our, the number of times we travel to a destination may get reduced. Uh, so I think each, for each university, depending on the kind of budget that is available to them, uh, you know, they will make uh, those decisions as to how to move forward and keep looking at their numbers as to see what the return has been based on these different approaches. Yeah, that's great. Great, great answer for, from you both. Thanks. Um, I want to step it up a notch um, and, and talk a little bit at a, at a higher level. Um, uh, you know, if we look at American higher education as a whole, uh, we're constantly facing threats, um, uh, you know, financial threats, uh, enrollment threats, um, and then threats from external sources, and particularly where international students are concerned, we face threats from uh, immigration limits, uh, uh, political change. We don't have to go into that in detail. We know what that's about. Um, so if you were to advise uh, your provosts and presidents, uh, and, and even your, your deans and vice presidents of admission and enrollment, um, how do we uh, effectively strategize to meet those challenges at, at, at a high level? What's the mindset that the leadership in American higher education needs to have in order to, uh, to, to meet those challenges, those external threats uh, head on? Yeah, you wanna take a, a swing at that one? It's not an easy one. Yeah, well, um, of course it does depend a great deal on what that external threat is because your strategy will be different for a pandemic than a political issue or immigration um, restrictions. So, so I don't know if you could have one strategy for all external threats. Another external threat, if you want to see that, is the competition from other countries. Mm -hmm. um, Australia, the UK, even Germany, many countries <laughs> language non their first language is not english are still highly competitive in terms of bringing international students to their countries to study so it really depends on the threat so when it comes to political change i think i have found that one of the better approaches is to support strongly the organizations that have a presence in Washington, D.C., who actually do a lot of lobbying. So I have found that APLU, for example, uh, has a pretty strong voice, NAFSA. There are organizations that whose, whose main focus is Washington, D.C., and getting legislation passed or at least mitigated that might you know, hurt the, the universities and the international student enrollment, uh, et cetera. Um, other types of external threats from other countries because they're more competitive than we are in terms of cost. That's something that is, uh, as we have seen, a much more difficult challenge um, to know how to strategize against. Uh, I would add something uh, as Pia has talked on the external side of things. One of the challenges that uh, all of us have uh, faced and we probably continue to do is advocacy even on campus. When we talk about international, there's a tendency to compartmentalize you know, the, what we are approaching because many don't truly understand. When we say immigration issue or political issue, for them it's like, oh, it's about getting a visa. Well, there's a whole process to it, why a student does not get. So there has to be a greater effort in terms of advocacy on campus 
to make uh, the deans and upper leadership, also faculty, to be aware of what these challenges are and what do the international students go through for us as universities to benefit from their presence. So that learning has to be also there, that there is a, is a greater uh, understanding of you know, what is it that is happening and how can we collectively help? Because they may have also, suddenly somebody might say, yeah, I think I know a connection over here who could probably help or we could argue, can we argue using such and such argument? So I think there has to be a coming together of the institution if they consider the presence of an international student as being important and relevant to their agenda. Then, you know, to educate them on how they can become partners in this effort uh, and you know they are all involved in this and that we all have a same, same goal. So I think there has to be also that kind of advocacy on campus uh, and maybe raise it a little bit, raise the bars uh, quite a bit for them to truly understand that this is part of the institutional strategy and not the agenda of one office. Yeah, that's a, a great point, both great points. Um, I, would, I would add that I think it's important for uh, higher education institutions to do to behave in ways that they have typically not behaved in before. Um, it, we all know from uh, many, many years of experience that uh, colleges and universities don't necessarily move at quick paces. Um, uh, we tend because of shared governance, but also because of being somewhat um, uh, conservative on the side of resources anyway, uh, or risk averse, let me say, um, uh, tend to move a little slowly. I, I think you know my advice going forward for senior leadership uh, would be you, you have to be able to pivot quickly. You have to be able to take risks. Uh, you have to be able to assess the risk to your institution, uh, and uh, you know as you both mentioned, take steps uh, to mitigate that either through uh, lobbying efforts in Washington uh, or through uh, uh, really understanding uh, what the impact is. Of, uh, of competition. So it's, it's, it's absolutely critical that I think as we go forward and as we learn from what we're experiencing now that institutions get, um, I wanna see kind of SWAT teams, you know, the teams of, of um, uh, senior level people, both in the administration and the faculty uh, that can get together regularly uh, to assess these kinds of risks and to, uh, uh, and, and to be able to be called into action quickly uh, when and if uh, a, a new crisis emerges. So, so that's my take on it. But let me turn it over to, uh, to Nick. Yes. Um, and I think we almost asked this uh, question, or at least we teased, that, uh, teased at it at the beginning. But given our current circumstances, we all know what that is. What practices can, can we apply to international student recruitment? to achieve our uh, recruitment goals when our resources are limited. If, they're, if, they're, if we know that our budgets are gonna be cut and we know that we're not gonna have the same kind of monies that we once were able to use, what strategies would you develop or wanna see using a limited budget and still trying to reach your goals? Okay, yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, this is a challenge which I think all uh, universities are going to face, the budget issue and who gets the priority in terms of how, many, how much money is doled out. Uh, I would say that um, one has to look at the current strategies, what is, is being done, uh, and to see what ne uh, needs to be done in terms of effectively uh, continuing with the recruitment efforts. So we'll find some creative ways. Uh, we've talked about agents. You'd have to develop new kinds of relationships with agents. They are there on the ground. You are not there. You cannot travel. They, in essence, become a little bit of your spokesperson. Now, it's easy to say spokesperson, which also means you have to train them a little bit so that they, they can truly be your voice the way you would like them to be. So I think that is a new kind of partnership that is going to develop in terms of that relationship with, uh, with institutions and agents. Now, universities which do not use agents and have traditionally done things on the, uh, in the past on their own, we have to go back to basics. You know, there was a time when we talked about armchair recruitment. Well, we'll have to redefine what armchair recruitment is and how can we make that happen, given the fact that we do have access to technology, which we can project, we can use in different ways. Um, even if you are using technology, uh, how adept are you? So training of staff who are on campus, you know, so that they become very technology savvy, so that they're communicating with the generation on a regular basis who are very comfortable. 
So their understanding, but I would say the most important thing is probably, you know, the counseling aspect. Uh, how do you stay with a student so that he or she who's interested actually ends up signing this dotted line and commits to you because, you know, the student can be sidetracked and go elsewhere. So I think to make it very robust from that angle, those are some of the things that we will have to start looking to not just say like, hey, you know, okay, we lost this student, we lost that student. No, now every student that is lost will mean something. Uh, and I think those are the things that we need to really, uh, you know, make important in terms of our recruitment process. And the final thing I will say is, uh, even our websites where I know people continue to look at websites, uh, they tend to be very outdated and heavy. Now, what do I mean by that? There's too much content mm -hmm. for a generation which is very, you know, bite-sized information looking. So we have to be able to provide information in such a way that they can digest easily and move the process forward. Yeah, I, I, I agree with, I agree with you, Dilly. <laughs> <laughs> um, absolutely. I, I guess I would say from, from my point of view, if the, if my administration cuts my recruitment budget and as I say, we don't know what next year's budget is going to look like. Definitely smaller. I think it's important for the recruiting teams and the international recruitment teams and admission teams have a very clear communication with the administration that if, if we don't have the same recruitment budget, we're not going to be able to deliver the same number of students. I think this is critical, that there's an understanding between what declining resources means in terms of uh, student enrollment and student in recruitment. And for those universities, and the University of North Texas is one of them, who are very dependent on tuition uh, as revenue, uh, we, I try to make the argument to my administration, look, recruitment, domestic and international, is critical. And it's critical to the fi financial well being of the university. And therefore, cutting recruitment is probably not as good an idea as thinking about are there some other areas that might be able to have a little bit less? I don't think this is a time to slow down your recruitment efforts. This is a time, I've always argued, to double down and to really get out there and continue what you're doing, because that is, that's really the only way to compete. Uh, you're not gonna find an argument from me on that one. <laughs> <laughs> you know, one of, the things, one of the things that I always thought was important is that we need to have more DLEEPs and, and peers in the senior international offices. And many institutions simply don't have that person on staff. They have others that play the role, but they're not internationalists. They don't understand the bigger pictures or the strategies involved to get that ball rolling. So from my perspective, I would, I would want to see a strong SIO in every institution, especially those institutions that link international enrollment as part of the mission, as part of the mission statement. And, and, as, and if it's really part of it, you make that, that mission statement come alive with the individual was responsible for putting the internationalization plan in place. So I'm just happy to hear both of you two, and you, you're sort of singing to the chorus when you're talking to me. So congratulations. Well, there's no, there's absolutely no question that uh, the recruitment of international students is going to be even more important than it was several years ago. Um, if, if for only the utilitarian reason that the domestic numbers are going down, obviously there are a lot more uh, good reasons to internationalize our campus than that. But uh, I do want to, we do have a question uh, from one of our um, uh, audience members. Um, and I think, Dilip, this is probably uh, for you to answer. Um, parents are often not as tech savvy as their students. How, how do we develop digital outreach for parents? Um, yes, I think what is happening, what we saw when we had admission table, because it was for primarily for students, and then we devised something for parents, is to educate them in a hybrid fashion many times to, because remember this generation, they do communicate with their parents. The parents are the final authority in terms of approving if the kid is going to go abroad or not for their studies. Mm -hmm. So at some stage we do 
so uh, we do advise the students to reach out to their parents and tell the parents that if they want to connect with us directly, there are ways and means uh, in, in terms of doing it. And that is where the introduction is uh, made. Uh, it is all from the idea of encouraging the student to make a decision with their parents. Um, and so we can have discussions with them. So we had, and on our platform, we had actually a space for parents to either uh, engage with us directly or if they wanted to engage with their kids with us. So that kind of engagement has to be brought in. Now, yes, we may say they're not tech savvy, but it, through their kids, they have become tech savvy or they have become tech savvy for specific things related to their uh, children's education, which is relevant and important for them to get involved in. So we are seeing a different, uh, from, in terms of a changing mindset, that parents do respond. They are aware of the fact that they cannot connect directly in terms of face-to-face. -face. Uh, they may not be able to travel to some of these fairs, or they may not be able to connect with the university when the universities are visiting. So they make alternate arrangements. And now what we are seeing is, they are also moving in onto an online space. One of the things which this pandemic has done is it has forced, like our faculty, it has forced everybody to deal with technology. They like it or not, they will have to deal with it. And with that, the education has begun in terms of the transformation of all, every single individual, I would say on this planet, of the use of technology. At, at the end of the day, they have to determine for themselves to what extent they are going to use technology. But we are talking pretty much at the basic level right now in terms of engaging with faculty. So I wouldn't put it beyond. I mean, if, if our, many of our own uh, colleagues who are in this room right now on this, uh, in this webinar, they have in their own ways been in, uh, kind of um, gone into this space. If they have little kids, their kids are now involved with technology and they are learning mm -hmm. how to share and teach their kids, not do, just do their homework, but actually teach their kids. So they're also learning the process of how to use technology. Yeah, I, would, I would just add that we we found it very <laughs> useful to make sure the websites have um, information in other languages, not the whole website, but key two or three pages of key ideas that we would want parents to know. So even if they can't read the whole English, and often parents aren't as um, English proficient as their children, there is information on the website for parents specifically in the language so that they could read it uh, directly for themselves. We also have a strategy, at least in India, we decided that we would make a, instead of traveling to India so often, and as you know, one trip to India can cost you, you know, five, $6,000, we decided to take some of that money and hire a, a university, our own representative in India. And that person has been incredibly helpful with parents. She is very savvy with the Indian uh, population, the youth, and she in person will go to Starbucks and have a coffee with students and parents. And we have found that to be very successful uh, in terms of reaching face to face, but we're not there. You know, she represents us there. Um, and that has been very uh, successful for us. And it's not your, as expensive as you think. Is that your only uh, regional person? Um, yep. Yeah. Right now, we, we decided we, this is sort of was a pilot. She's now in her second year with us. And so we may look at, at other places as well to do this. And does she try, she, India is a big country, so she travels around, I would guess. Yes, yes. But a lot less expensive for domestic flights uh, than- Absolutely, uh, yeah. yes, yes. Sure, sure. And that is, a, that is a very clever strategy where, yeah. you know, the amount you spend on a couple of trips to India would probably account for 75% of your operating budget for India if you have a person on site. So the and, uh, and you have a person who's 24 seven, 12 months of the year. So yep. it is a very effective way of doing it. And we have worked with universities in the past uh, and served as their point person. And, and it has, the yield has been tremendous. And 
Um, I would strongly recommend all types of institutions. It has nothing to do with, oh, you have got to be a top 10 or 12, top 20 university. It's all types of universities. And it is about having your presence there. And if you have a presence there, the possibility of, you know, a student or a family or a parent connecting with you and considering your institution is going to be so much more higher. So, um, Bob, can I answer this question or not? Sure, sure. yeah. Go ahead. Okay. So there is a question that asks if the University of North Texas, uh, if we are we are offering online courses in the fall, is the tuition rate going to be the same as on the ground classes? No, it's not going to be the same. In fact, um, there is going to be a rather significant difference between the in-person courses that we might offer if the international student could come to the US and what we are going to charge them if they stay in their own country. And of course, a lot of the difference are the fees, right? There's no reason for them to pay any of the fee, you know, the student health fee, the library fee, the, you know, the Activity. fees are significantly less. Uh, and, and the tuition will have a special online rate. So no, it will be less expensive than if they came in person. So we have uh, one question, I think it's a great question from uh, uh, one of the members of, of our audience. Um, if, if you were to list the top two or three takeaways that this crisis has taught international recruiters and, and educators, uh, what would they be? That's, it's a tough question, <laughs> but it's a great one. Um, one has to diversify in, in every sense of the word, Dif diversify your recruitment approaches and start looking at all the different things that could be done, can be done, uh, might be done. Uh, it's not to uh, diversify the countries. We've talked about it also briefly uh, to look at not just the large sending uh, countries, but also to see where else, based on your alumni, based on your other contacts. You know, if you have a large Armenian population near your university, they may have certain inroads into the into Armenia which you may not have explored. So I think there are various creative ways of of doing it, um, and to create uh, more advocacy or engage at least in terms of getting the word out on campus of how people need to be working together to make this make it happen. Uh, because there is going to be a tremendous amount of sinking of things. Um, your resources are going to be uh, lesser, so how do you leverage that with other ways? So to make your own job and the job of those who are helping recruit easier to be able to drive and to develop new uh, partnerships uh, in terms of how you engage with different kinds of entities, just things which Pia has also mentioned. I'll turn it to you, Pia. Yeah. yeah um... This has been a crisis like no other. Uh, I think it has made all of us very um, cognizant of the need, as Bob spoke just a little bit ago, to be able to pivot and to pivot quickly. And I think that was one of the most surprising things about this crisis, that universities known for their inability <laughs> to pivot quickly have all pivoted quickly to put all of their courses online. Um, it's been unbelievable how in a week everybody had to be up and online. So, but I still think the, one of the major takeaways is being able to do that more often and to be able to do it in, in different scenarios. And international recruitment is one of those areas that we need to be very, very diversified. I'd like to say universities also need to think about the future when there may not be as many international students studying abroad uh, as before, as we know we've had a couple of shocks when the Brazilian scholarship program ended, when the Saudi scholarship program <coughs> or, or was changed, and people were caught um, flat-footed, particularly, for example, intensive English language programs, of which many have shut now, because they weren't sort of prepared for shocks like these. And I do worry, for example, if there were a, an economic crisis or an economic shock in India or, China or any major sending country, uh, universities need to be prepared with what that would mean. 
I mean, I, yeah, I will agree 100%, so my turn to agree with you, Peter. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think being nimble is going to be a key thing, something which we have, we have to be able to make decisions in a week and things like that, rather than spreading our meetings over the entire semester. It'll have to be done three meetings this week, and we're going to wrap this up and move, uh, move forward. The other reality is we have to accept the fact that this whole pandemic, which has obviously kind of uh, impacted the economic environment also, and for international students, that is a very, very crucial uh, element for the parents to make that decision about sending their son or daughter abroad is, okay, they're going to get a great education, but after that, what? So that has to be able to, you know, our institutions should be in a position to, because we can't say we don't know. Well, if you say we don't know, then it's not going to go through. The, the parents are going to rethink, you know, their commitment to sending the kid away and spending so much time, uh, so many resources in terms of getting an education. So I think we have to be also aware of the economic environment, in this case, the U.S. What kind of employment is there going to be for these students? Because they're coming primarily with that idea in mind after four years or, or a master's, I hope to get em employment in the United States. So how are we going to address that? We have to look at our own domestic policies or international policies from, the, from Washington DC coming out. How does this pan out in terms of visas? How, how does this pan out in terms of Im immigration issues? What is the message that is going on that is being interpreted on the other side of the waters of what does this mean? So we have to become sensitive to all that and consequently something which we've not talked about too much, but develop, you know, scholarships or opportunities that will allow for these students to come here and for our universities to benefit from their presence. So I think it's going to be a lot of things that are going to come into play to make that thing happen or to convince these students to, you know, say like, hey, I'm going to the U.S. to study. Great. I, I think one of the things that I would, one of my takeaways um, would be that the institutions really need to begin to ask and answer the tough questions that they have been avoiding for years. And, and the main one for me is, what do we really do best? Let's invest in that and let's begin to divest in other areas. And that's very difficult for institutions to do, but it seems to me that with the, uh, the, the extraordinary economic impact that the pandemic has and will have, and the federal bailout, while great, is, is hardly enough to uh, cover that for colleges and universities, um, it, we, we, we really need to decide uh, what we can do well. We need to partner with other institutions that do things better than we do. Uh, and we need to focus our resources. Otherwise, um, we're going to find ourselves uh, when the next crisis comes uh, as, as ill prepared as we were uh, for this one. I'm, I'm, I'm very optimistic that institutions um, will rise to the occasion uh, in terms of, um, you know, what they're uh, doing uh, uh, on a tactical level, I'm less optimistic that they'll be more strategic about it uh, looking, looking forward. So that's my uh, two cents there in terms of takeaway. We, we have only a couple of minutes left. Um, so with that, uh, let me ask if anyone has any you know, 30 second comment that they want to make before I um, uh, close the webinar. I would leave it for questions if there are any. Okay, uh, we've we've had we've had four or five questions. Uh, they've they've all been answered. So let me thank you again. Thank the panelists, uh, Dalip and Pia. Uh, thank Nick for his uh, uh, great assistance and input in making this uh, a possibility and a and a reality. Uh, we will be sending a link. Oh, and I should uh, uh, also thank Carrie Uncle, who's uh, behind the screen there, who's uh, the vice president for marketing and communications for. Um, uh, Hudson Global Scholars for uh, helping us to put this on uh, and for making the arrangements uh, to market it as well. Um, she will be sending out a link, or I will, uh, to of the recording uh, to all of the participants, everyone who registered. I would ask you to uh, share the link with your colleagues. I also want to remind you that next week at this time, um, with uh, Andrea Felder from American University and Bobby Fernando from NYU, two veteran international admissions folks, uh, they're going to be talking about specific strategies 
uh, for recruiting, enrolling, and retaining international students during and after the global pandemic. So once again, thank you all, and uh, hope to see you next week. Uh, thank you, Dia, uh, Pia, and Dalip, uh, and Nick. Thank Have you all. Take care. <laughs>